Hey, you got me? Yeah, thanks for joining me on such short notice. No problem, anytime. So, you know, I was, I've been doing these panels of the high school coaches and we we're going to do one to update before the playoffs. And but all of a sudden, I think they got real superstitious and they all ghosted me. I haven't been able to get them. So he said, you know what, I need to go, I'm going to go right to the source and go right to the to Virginia Preps, Matthew Hat Hatfield, who is a high school, high school sports guru. Sure, no problem. Glad to do it. Just uh, got back from uh, Western Kentucky last night with our ODU women's team. Had a couple road games at Marshall and there, but I've been following, watching some games on the bus on my phone through the NFHS, following different scores, been watching games on Huddle. So I've still, I've still uh, stayed in the loop of what's going on for the most part. How are, how are you enjoying um, your, your radio work with ODU? Enjoying it a lot. Uh, having a great time. Uh, team's doing pretty well. Uh, so far this season, we're in the Conference USA race. Just dropped to fourth in CUSA East standings after a loss to drop us to 16-5 and five overall. Tough one. Uh, the Monarchs, the Lady Monarchs, as they're usually known for, although that moniker is now, I'll just say it's Monarchs technically. But anyway, uh, they uh, trailed by 26 on Saturday at Western Kentucky in the second quarter, got within three in the third quarter, fell short in that comeback effort. Um, but this is a team that's won nine in a row, as I mentioned, 16-5 uh, and five on the year, 6-3 and three in the conference. Uh, going into yesterday, they were number five in the nation in scoring defense, which is pretty good in women's basketball. I mean, Georgia Tech was one. I think you had uh, Liberty four, Central Florida three. So to be in that, in that kind of company is – is impressive. Still working some kinks out offensively, but this team could be, uh, we'll, we'll see, maybe NCAA tournament bound if they can win the uh, CUSA tournament next month in Frisco. So uh, enjoying it a lot. The one thing I'm not loving is the nine hour bus ride. Uh, you get the back aches and the, and the backside aches uh, to Huntington. That was not fun, but fortunately we chartered back from uh, Western Kentucky last night. So that was better than the bus ride. <laughs> yeah. Well, because of COVID, they probably spread you guys out in the bus a little bit though, right? A so little bit. Yeah, yeah. As much as we can. Yeah, it's it, fortunately we're not having to follow. I mean, we're following COVID protocols, but it's not as strict to the to the point where it was maybe a year ago, which I didn't I just started this season. So uh, but still, you know, you're, you're masking up, you're doing all the proper things. And we did have as a team a COVID pause for 22 days as the calendar was kind of turning from December into January. A lot of teams are going through that. But fortunately, knock on wood, hopefully there's not going to be any additional COVID pauses as we're seeing less of those across uh, both the college basketball sport and high school sports. As you know, Julian, I mean, the weather, it impacted our second Virginia Preps Classic. We had our first one. Fortunately, we were able to get that in. Had a couple of Northern Virginia teams come down in Hayfield who beat Lansdowne in a really good ball game on January the 8th at Green Run High School in our 13th annual uh, VA Preps Classic. And Thomas Edison lost to Oscar Smith out of Chesapeake. Uh, those two teams, Edison uh, and Hayfield, out of Class 6, just like Oscar Smith and Lanton are out of Class 6. Uh, could see a couple of them in the championship pursuit. But our second one, and we were supposed to have some teams come down like Patriot, in fact, who's undefeated, uh, just like Hayfield. Uh, we had to wipe that off because of snow, not COVID, back on January 22nd, as it felt like we had about three straight weekends of snow and ice across the whole state. Have you gotten a chance to know any of the, uh, the, the women, the players and the coaches at, at ODU since you've been working there? A little bit. I mean, I try not to be intrusive, but also cordial and, and communicate with them pretty well. Um, like I said, Demet Delisha Milton Jones, the head coach who is up for the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame, should get an announcement hopefully in the next couple of weeks that she's in, fingers crossed. Um, she's great. I like what she's doing with the team. Great energy. She's authentic. And then we've got a couple of assistants that have some pro experience, including Shimon Williams, who played in the NBA, North Carolina. Uh, and then some of the players, we, we've got a lot of new faces. I think it's eight eight or nine new players on the squad this year. A couple of them are out for the rest of the campaign, it looks like with injuries, but uh, for the most part, it's a good group. And uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun for sure. All right. One, one thing that uh, folks are listening, uh, Matthew has a great YouTube channel. He, he does great interviews with a lot of the high school coaches and players right after the games. I, I love his interviews with uh, Darren Sanderlin, uh, Stefan Welsh, all, a lot of the great uh, players that I, that I watch when they're playing, now they're coaching. So I love listening to them being interviewed. Matthew has a lot of, uh, a, a long list of folks he interviews, hundreds probably since the season began, uh, that are great. Also, his, his ESPN radio um, interviews are on there as well. I, I listened to your Bobby Dandridge interview, which was great. You, you, you. Had, the, you had the pro baseball player, a couple, I forgot his name now. I'm just lost. Yeah, it. Chris Taylor from the LA Dodgers, who played in our state at Cox High in Virginia Beach and also at UVA, won a championship there. Yeah, I, I, as UVA guy, I probably shouldn't be forgetting that one. But um, 
But anyway, uh, folks, make sure you check out your uh, your YouTube channel. It's, it's awesome. So look, uh, to get to high school basketball, last mm-hmm. night there was a big game in Richmond. I'm, I'm sure you weren't there, but I, I see that uh, Hayfield uh, beat John Marshall. Were you were you surprised by that result? Um, the margin, yes. The result, no. I thought that Hayfield could win the game and probably would win the game. It's a good John Marshall team that's got a top 250 really a top 150 junior in the nation in Dennis Parker Jr. who's getting offers from all over SEC, Big Ten, uh, Big 12 schools are all over him. But I I felt like Hayfield had a little bit more in the backcourt with their guard play, which I think is going to separate them in the postseason. Uh, Certainly uh, in the inside, David King, who's an undersized, uh, just glue guy for them, got the MVP in our event uh, against Lancetown, and he had a career high, I think, of 31 not too long ago against Mount Vernon. He's a big factor for them in the paint and just has a way of, you know, knifing through and carving out space to score. But really what I think allows Carlos Poindexter's team to be a championship level team and undefeated at this point in the season is just their ability to push the pace with those guards and Braylon Wheeler, two sports stand out, Daryl DJ Holloway, and then Ashton Pratt, who can really knock it down from long distance. And then Greg Jones is such a matchup problem for them. Uh, he's probably – you know, truth be told, the only bona fide Division One mid-major plus type guy on that roster, even though they have some other quality players that can play and excel at the next level. And some say, wow, John Marshall's got three or four guys with offers. They got Parker. They got uh, Dennis Stinson, big guy who came in from uh, this past off season. They got uh, – or Steven Stinson, excuse me, Dennis Stinson. Uh, Steven Stinson, Dennis Parker. They got a point guard in Damon uh, Red Thompson who's going to be really good, a couple of shooters. But – it's, a, it's some new faces and they don't have the chemistry and the connectivity and playing as long together as Hayfield does. Hayfield got that experience of last year going to the States. John Marshall didn't have a season and they can say what they want about travel ball with team loaded, which they do a superb job with that. And they did have a little bit of a shortened type of season in, in a, um, I don't know exactly what they called it, but it was like a showcase type of thing where they went on the road for some games. It wasn't the same as having a, a high school season, that competition going through the playoffs like Hayfield did. So I felt like, the Hawks would win that game. But had you told me they'd win by 14, I'd be like, no, it's probably gonna be like more like six to 10 points. So I thought they, they, you know, they were able to distance themselves, which is kind of what they did towards the end of the game with Lansdowne. They fell behind in our event on January the 8th, early in the third quarter, but they finished up with a strong burst. And just uh, this team's maturity level, I think has been impressive because, as you know, and I'm sure we'll get to this with Patriot, to get to this point of the season, unbeaten it's it's got to take a laser focus and you can't have that let down because if you do you'll get beat uh, before we get back to Hayfield is, is that Marshall team are, is it is it hard for them because they, they're uh, I guess they're a class two uh division two school is it is it a step up because you know historically the Richmond schools were, were triple a the highest classification back in the yeah. day um uh is it, is it a difficult matchup when they have to step up and play a classic uh division six school some would say yes. I would think it is more for a sport like football where you have 11-on-11 11 11 as opposed to 5-on-5. Five five. And I think uh, for Ty White's team, they beat a couple of years back in our Virginia Preps Classic, Lancetown, which went on, went on to win a state championship that year in the event. And they've beaten some fives and six. And they play some out-of-state teams. They go down to Georgia. They play teams from all over um, as Ty White tries to have them as a national-level team. I don't think it's as hard, but I do think what is more challenging for them is kind of what I uh, hit on was that they don't have – they have some new faces that come in a lot of years. They get some transfers in, and they haven't been playing as long together. And Parker had an injury for a while, uh, a year ago. So they haven't meshed as long and as well as Hayfield has. So when they run to an experienced team, it's a big test for them, even though they've probably seen some other teams with more size, more college prospects, and as much, if not more, overall athleticism. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's get back to Hayfield. They, they had a scare against – uh, Lewis and Lewis is it's interesting with Lewis the record is not great but they played yeah. civil friends tough earlier this year and civil friends is amazing um it took it took Hayfield to overtime I'm not sure if Carlos was saving some of the starters for the weekend because he had a Friday set and Saturday set um but generally things have gone really well with Hayfield they, they've, they've beaten St. Uh, uh, Bishop Ireton uh, with a top um transfer from Lake Braddock um you know they, they, they've had a really tough schedule they went down in your tournament and played um and Lansdowne's, so I, I think they have the the, the, the uh, schedule strength, the talent. Um, they have a lot of uh, pedigree of uh, football players that have, have won uh, on the football field. So that gives them a competitive edge. Um, and they look at, they're looking pretty good going into the postseason, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think? Oh, I think they're the favorite, hands down. And I think you can make the argument. I got some texts from coaches uh, inside Northern Virginia and outside of the area last night as I was getting back. And they were, they were just, you know, talking about that game and that big win. And 
um, how it was in Lewis, which used to be Lee, had that run against him and gave him a battle. And he thought I had to come back the last four or five minutes, get it to overtime. Then they dominated the overtime. I think that was just a case of a, you know, you, you have those this is high school kids still. They have that moment. Where they do have a little bit of a lapse. But um, I think they're as good as any team in any division. You know, we've got our top tens up on Virginia preps. We rank the teams in each of the six classifications. And someone asked me back in uh, early to mid-January who the best team was in all classifications. And at that point, I said, it's probably between Hayfield and John Marshall. And my thought was John Marshall hadn't hit its stride yet. I thought they were going to just dominate class two. And I think they still probably will win the class two state championship, even though East Rockingham with the UNC commit Tyler Nickel. Uh, James River uh, out of Buchanan is playing really well. They've got some shooters, and there's a couple other teams that could certainly be factors in that pursuit for uh, Ty White's justice to win another state championship. But you just look at the body of work and how they played. Hayfield's right there is, is playing as well as anybody. The other team that could have an argument is Verina out of Richmond, which has a very athletic group. Uh, they get up and down the court about as well as anybody, which includes Hayfield, and they have a player in Alfonso Fats Billups, a guard who's going to VCU, who's very exciting. Uh, going to the basket, and he also distributes it very well. He's kind of a multifaceted player, has improved his jump shot, which a couple of years ago was non-existent. Now it's it's fairly respectable. So their team they also circle, and beating L.C. Bird is in by double figures like they did is no small feat as well. So those are probably the two most impressive wins across the state over the weekend was Verina beating Bird, which had come into that game, I think, like 14-1, 15-1, and Hayfield knocking off John Marshall as almost, you can almost say almost as easily as it, Look, it might not have been easy for them, but it certainly felt that way. The one thing I do wonder for both of those teams is going to be when you get in the playoffs, if you experience foul trouble, you get different officiating crews, you get different styles of play, you play teams from other parts of the state, how your bench does if someone fouls out or someone goes down. You never can predict injuries or the outcome of that. I think Hayfield starting five is the best in the state. I'm curious to see if someone can step up off that bench if they need that to happen mm -hmm. to get through in like a regional final, a state semifinal, a state championship level game uh, the good thing is though that state or that region championship now is almost that freebie game in the sense of it's not win or go home back in the abbreviated season it was they only took two uh, one team per region now they're going back to the two teams per region eight teams across the state in each division goes to the state tournament yeah, that's going to be great well yeah. who else are you looking at in northern virginia so uh, we'll get to patriot but if we're, yeah. if we're talking about the former northern region area the fairfax county arlington yeah. um i know madison and south lakes have played well um, but it's, it's been very it's been very balanced up here. It has been. I like how Madison's defended. Uh, they they seem to have – they're the one team that you could almost say, this is no knock on uh, South Lake. So I've gotten to watch on film. They were mighty impressive in a game I watched against Skyline with Colin Luongo, who's a shooter, and uh, Kyle Tang, who makes things go for them at point guard. Uh, EJ Finney's a good athlete. But uh, Madison just kind of has their number when they go head-to-head. -head. They beat them in the playoffs last year. They beat them this season, and they just defend very, very well. They got a couple of knockdown shooters. Um, the team that's really been the surprise to me, Julian, across the state, there's a couple of them, but in Northern Virginia, it's Potomac Falls. I thought going into the year in that Potomac district in uh, class five, you're looking at probably Stonebridge and Independence. And they played a good game of the night. Independence won it at home. And those are two prolific shooting teams. I mean, Independence this year has hit 100 and 14 threes, 57 by Wes Williams, the guard. And they also got Elijah Easter, newcomer in the backcourt, Mateen Purdue, who came over from Broad Run, who's a factor for them in the front court. Stonebridge, we saw them have that uh, miraculous run to the state championship, that big comeback against Green Run. They've got those two football studs back in Jacob Thomas and Dylan Hundemark. But really the addition of Sam Whitehead as, as a factor for them, shooting the basketball 20 points per game is big. And they've hit 88 threes as a team. They've gone to the foul line 291 times this year. So they can hit threes, they're aggressive. The one thing about those two teams that's different from, say, Potomac Falls is I think Potomac Falls doesn't have the outside punch, the firepower, but they defend really well. And I think this team has come along further than some expected. Even maybe Coach Jeff Hall is because uh, Elijah, Elijah uh, Edegbenro, I don't even pronounce his name right, Edegbenro, A-D-E-G-B-E-N-R-O. I think it's Edegbenro. They'll correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, later. But Like, like, I, like I know for sure. <laughs> He's the guy that makes them go, though. He's like 13 points a game. He's a 6'3 forward. And you've seen Potomac Falls in the past, Julian. They, I mean, they had Lucas Milanovic and even his son Landon. Uh, Ian Anderson was a good front court piece. They had some outside shooters. This team really doesn't have a lot of three-point makes this year. They've made, as a group, I think 46 in 19 games. But they're just doing it by going to the basket, playing unselfishly, playing a hard-nosed defense. They've won a lot of close games. I'm curious because this is a big week for them to finish the season. I think they've won now like 13 in a row to get to 17-3. and three. 
Um, their point guard is five foot eight, Kyle Abels. He's got three steals a game. He's not a household name. He's not one of the guards you hear about and read about in Northern Virginia, but they're just doing it as like a workman-like group. And I'm sure Coach Halls is loving it. He's very animated and energetic on the sidelines if you've seen them play over the years. Um, these are two big games coming up with Stonebridge and Independence in rematches because they beat both of them close. One of them, I think, went to overtime, and they've just been kind of pulling out tight wins, tight wins. Riverside is no slouch. They just beat Independence here recently. Uh, and Riverside had taken a couple of uh, la losses. I think they got beat by the Briar Woods or Woodgrove before that. But so they're kind of like all beating up on each other. The two districts that, that feel like the most competitive are the Potomac district where you've got Stonebridge and Potomac Falls and Independence Riverside. And then up in class six, that, you know, that Patriot district where you've got all, all they always beat up on each other with South County. Mike Robinson's team starting to run in the form at the right time of the right. year. W.T. Woodson, who's got a big win the other night. Doug Craig's team beat Lake Braddock, where uh, uh, Brady Lentz had 20 points and 20 rebounds, and the sophomore Ethan Conklin dropped 20. Lake Braddock, their pace of play always keeps them in the mix with Coach Brian Mitris and, and even Fairfax, who's having a great year with Margot yeah. uh, Choi Jolson. Uh, Mike Barbie's got a team that's defended very, very well this year. They're probably as, as they're, on the, they're certainly in the top three to top five in the area defensively, you know, pretty much routinely. And they're, they're really controlling pace and defending well. And Margot gives them a chance in a, in a playoff spot if he has a big fourth quarter in a, in a key spot. So that district, and then you, even though I think the depth though in that district, once you get past those top four, because you can't sleep on West Potomac, uh, David House has got a good group there. And even Alexandria has some athletes that you have to be careful of that, that playoff, uh, bracket's going to be really, really fierce because you could have a lower seed knock off a top seed, and some will be surprised, but it won't shock me because they're all pretty evenly matched. Yeah. Well, you know, it's been interesting, and the surprise has been Marshall, and they, they yes. lost. They lost last night to WNL, and but and they lost to uh, to Wakefield, uh, I guess earlier this week. But they they had a big win on Friday against. Um, I'm losing it, but that but that district's been very wide open this year. It has. And it's funny because I thought uh, going into the year, uh, Wakefield might be a year away and they just notched a big one here recently about a week or two ago. Um, huge win for them. And Tony Bentley's team generally gets hot around the playoff time. And, and I felt like they had some juniors and sophomores. It'll take some time to get going. But uh, WNL just beat Wakefield by 14, as you mentioned. Um, and you know, really, I think that's one of those that's a toss up because you, you're curious to see when you get in the tournament, how those teams pace of play matches up with some of those teams from like the Concord. They're they're more, I think, the defensive minded team. They want to keep the score in the low to mid 50s, whereas some of those teams in the Liberty District, in the National District, where you have the, uh, the Washington Liberties, the Marshalls, the Wakefields. Uh, throw in their Yorktown as well. They want to play a little bit higher scoring game in the 60s and 70s. So I'm curious to see how that contrast goes when we get to the Region 6D tournament um, and even that Aquan Region 6C tournament where you've got, you know, the heavy hitters, the Hayfields, the South Counties, the Woodsons. Um, you, you do get a little bit of a different style of play. Even though some of those teams play during the season, you also go into tournament basketball and it's kind of adapting to what you know, how does your strength go against the other team's strength? If it's an offensive team against a team that kind of locks up defensively or a team that likes to play more zone as opposed to man, those type of things. Yeah, let's, let's go a little bit south. Let's, uh, Patriot has been rolling this year. Sherman's having a great time. Every time I see him on, on YouTube, he's dancing and they're, and they're winning. Um, how, <laughs> how, good, how good is Patriot and um, who are their, their chief competitors to, to go to state? Yeah, I think they're better than we've all realized because if you look at their roster, Julian, this is the thing that really jumps out at me because you'll see this sometimes in the state tournament. We've seen it in recent years, the the Wake, uh, the Westfields, excuse me. Doug Ewell had that group with Tyler Scanlon and Blake Francis, and they were so close to winning a state championship. Colonial Forge won their back-to-back -back state titles. They actually they denied Westfield of winning maybe back-to-back -back there. A couple of those teams, you'll see them as juniors, and you say, oh, this group could be around for a couple of years. You look at his roster. Certainly Nick Marrero, the 6'2 guard, and Courtney Davis, the 6'2 guard, who had a double-double here recently, and Mike Ackerman, the 5'10 guard, who knocks down threes. They're seniors on this crew. On this crew, The rest of this team, juniors and sophomores, and they're getting contributions from Nasir Coleman, Desmond Hopkins, a couple of 5'11 guards, Jay Randall inside, 6'3 forward, Isaiah, Fick, uh, Isaiah Vick, 
six five sophomore Ford. Shout out to his pops, Dwight Vick, former Virginia Tech football player. Is he Michael um, Vick's cousin or any relation? Yeah, related to Michael Vick. Great dude. If you follow him on Twitter, you get all kinds of Hokies and great sports <laughs> info. He's 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 super. Loved uh, Dwight. Um, but his son can ball. He had a great game in their opener against Potomac when they beat Potomac, and that was kind of a hurdle for them, Julian, because Potomac had had their number. I mentioned about, you know, Madison, South Lakes, get over that, that stumbling block. And that would be an interesting storyline if we get to South Lakes, Madison in 6D. 6B, it feels like it's Patriots to win because fifth year in a row they've won the Cedar Run. And the Cedar Run has had some, you know, teams that have been uh, factors before. Battlefield made a state semifinal run back in the day when they had Braden Galt. I lost to Oscar Smith the year that Westfield beat them in a state championship. You can't sleep on uh, Unity Reed. Osborne under Rocky Carter's had some competitive teams, and he's got a young man, Tay Barber, who's filling it up this year, scoring the basketball. So you got some teams there that will push a little bit. Again, different style of play than, say, maybe you see in the Patriot or Concord District or more up and down, free-flowing. Uh, but I think they're the team to beat in 6B. Now, it's a big region at 16 schools. John Champ is dangerous. Walt Webb's got a team that is not going to be afraid of them. Uh, Battlefield has played them before close, and they're a district foe that, that's familiar with them, so there's a familiarity factor there. Um, you can never count out Potomac, although I think this is sort of an uh, inexperienced group for Keith Honoré, and congrats to him. He just picked up career win number 300. Uh, okay. Fantastic job he's done there. And his son, Kyle Honoré, if you've been following him, we just put up a story on Virginia Preps. He's been, he had a stretch where he averaged like 29 points per game through six games, so he's been doing a lot for them. I just wonder, though, it is it too much for him to carry this team by himself? He needs help from guys two through five. And I know some of those guys are kind of green right now for Potomac. So, you know, in the last few years, it's been Potomac as the favorite. Patriot was the top contender to them, and they just couldn't get over that hurdle. I think Potomac has taken a step back, and I would label Patriot the favorite, and the top contenders to them would be both, in my eyes, John Champ and Woodbridge. I think Woodbridge is the sleeper. Courtney Kofer's team has played really, really well this year. Uh, they did have a little bit of a close setback the other night against Freedom, who's as athletic as any group. Freedom's just very unpredictable. You don't know what team's going to show up, and they're certainly going to be uh, a fly in the ointment in this region tournament. But um, Woodbridge has got a, a well-knit you know, knit group. I like what they've done this year. I'm not sure they can get by Patriot, though. I think Patriots just got a little bit more. They're sound defensively. They share the ball. Um, and it's not about one guy having to score for them, which I think is going to be their strength. Similar to Hayfield, Hayfield's got a lot of offensive firepower. Patriot, I thought maybe going into the year would be a year away from being a championship level team, but hey, they haven't lost yet. Their confidence is growing. And the, and the nice thing about, as I'm sure Sherm is finding out or already knew, if he didn't find, if, if he hasn't, you know, haven't found it out this year, is some of those kids that are sophomores and juniors that haven't been on that stage before, they don't know any better. So this is a chance to kind of arrive a little earlier than some expected. Yeah. Well, let's go to Hampton Roads, your, 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 um, your base. Uh, what's, what's going, what's going on there? It's, it seems like it's, it, it's pretty uh, wide open uh, in, in Norfolk and, uh, and also New, uh, Hampton Newport News. Uh, to an extent, I think three teams have nudged ahead as state title contenders uh, and they're in class four and class five going into the year. I thought Lanstown was the best team. And I still think they can hoist a state championship out of class six and Virginia beach. They've gotten some tussles, haven't had a setback in their district uh, with the likes of green run. Who's been in back-to-back -back state championships. A lot of new faces for them. Princess Anne who's coming on strong here late Kempsville under Darren Sandler, who had a great start nine and zero. then they just suffered their first two losses this week to princess Anne and to a green run, which was not a real shock. You figured someone would test them and they've got coming up on Monday night, Lanstown at a big matchup there, but the thing that keeps sticking out to me about Lanstown is I think they're going to get there. If, if they ultimately match up with, say, Hayfield, can they get them? Because it feels like Lanstown doesn't have as many horses. Kind of going back to what I said about Potomac with Kyle Honore, Donald Han Jr. is the best player in my eyes in the whole state. I don't think there's a whole lot of argument. If you look at what he did last year in that state semifinal game when he was 27 of 27 or 29 of 29 from the foul line at 41 points, he routinely scores 30-plus. He's now getting his teammates involved, and his teammates have gotten better Ethan Ward inside, Jackson Tellefson on the wing. I just don't know if they have, if they get that matchup again, if they have enough. I, I won't count out Dwight Robinson. He's, he's certainly among the very best coaches in the state that we've seen in the last 20, 25 years, and they play defense. But I just wonder if they'll have enough in that type of matchup. But in Class 5 and Class 4 teams, I probably didn't label as state championship level teams, but probably could be state tournament teams going in. Maury and Kikatan. Maury is playing some just lights out defense, Julian. Brandon Plummer, the coach there who played for Darren Sandlin at Booker T. Washington when they won a state championship 
in 2005-06, beat that Scotty Reynolds-led Herndon team to win the title. Maury won a state title a few years ago. They beat Green Run on their way to the championship in the region final. Uh, they beat Verina in the state semifinals at Norview High School. That was a very good Verina team coming off a state title the year before when they beat Wakefield. And that team was an experienced team with some headline names. Chase Coleman, who went on to play at UVA, brother of Matt Coleman, Brian Phillips, Matthew Menzia. This Maury team does not have any type of headline names, D1 recruits, prospects that you would say are all regional, state-level guys. That team also had Clarence Rupert, who's now playing Division I college basketball. He went on to transfer the next year to Miller School. And that's an interesting story because Miller School, a big-time private school that gets a lot of players in, boarding school, they played Maury in our event. And I think Coach Plummer was a little hesitant of playing them, Julian, because they've got seven or eight guys, six, five or bigger. Maury has nobody. 6'5 or bigger, and they beat Miller 54 to 50 in our event. They did it with defense. I mean, they locked them up defensively. And if you look at what Maury's done this year, they're 17 and 0, 14 and 0 in rating scale games. They've held six straight opponents below 40 points, and they're limiting opponents to just 34 points per game. Now, the Eastern District historically has been one of the best districts in the state. Up there in Northern Virginia, as you know, certainly people re revere about what the Patriot District does or the Concord, the, the, that district, this district. I think statewide, people talk a lot about in Richmond, the Central District, which has your Petersburgs, your Hopewells, your Thomas Dales, your Meadowbrooks. And then down here in Tyler, they talk about the East District because you have all those Norfolk schools, Portsmouth schools, the Booker T's, the Norcoms, who's won state championships. And they're having a rough year. They haven't won a game yet this year for Norcom, who's won six state titles. Yeah, rough year for them. But you think of Maury, you think of Granby, you think of Lake Taylor. Some of these teams, Norview, they've been in the state championship game or won them here recently. Uh, matter of fact, all those Norfolk schools have been in or won a state championship game in the last three decades. Uh, in Maury's case, this, they kind of came off the radar screen because people didn't see this coming. They've got a lot of, similar to Patriot, they got a lot of juniors and sophomores, so they'll be back in this spot, I think, next year. But the thing I worry about is the Eastern District is down as a whole this year. They didn't play basketball last year. So some of those other teams have not developed like you would have thought. Yeah. So is Maury beating up on some not so good teams, patting their record against less than seller quality competition? You would think that, however, that win over middle school showed me when you beat a team that has six, seven and six, eight guys going to Navy, guys going to Fairfield. That shows me you're legit. I think that was a validating moment. And Brandon Plummer, that game meant a lot to him personally to lose his best player from a state championship team who transferred there, reclassified there in Clarence Rupert, and you go beat that school kind of a like, all right, you don't need to leave us to go to the next level. You can play here and get to college. So, you know, the public private guys are, they're very, very, uh, I think a lot of ownership of it. It means a lot to them. So, uh, and then the other two I mentioned, Kikatan in class five, Dewan DJ Campbell. He's been a lethal scorer. He led the Peninsula as a freshman in scoring. They've been winning some close games. And I think this year the Peninsula is the toughest district. It's revered for its years of football dominance. And in the 90s when they had those championship teams during the Allen Iverson era, Bethel and the Hampton era, and even Cat Barber's team at Hampton not too long ago. But uh, it's back to where the Peninsula is starting to run into form where they have a lot of quality teams. Mench feels good under Coach Lamont Struthers. His son Etienne can shoot it. Uh, Bethel's had a really good year. Um, you look back at Woodside was Stephon Welsh's team. They beat Kikatan in the opener, and Kikatan has not lost a game since then. They've won now 14, 15, maybe 16 in a row. They've been on a hot streak, and they've won some close games here. So I think those battles will prepare them for the postseason. That tournament, though, that Region 5B, you talk about great region tournaments, Julian. These are the nine schools. You take away Gloucester and Granby, who have losing records, okay? Then you've got Bethel, Kikatan, Maury, Menchville, Nansman River, Norview, Woodside. Nansman River has the seventh worst record and they're nine and five under coach Ed Young, my radio co-host on Saturday mornings, who's 15 wins away from 500 in his career. That's the seven seed. They're nine and five. They're the seven seed. Seven seed. Yeah. Well, good it's, it's, it's good stuff, Matthew. And I, you, oh, you, I forgot one more team real quick. King Spork, his rival who he plays yeah. Tuesday night, they're unbeaten and they're going to get on me big time because I mentioned best team in the state. Without, uh, with, you know, as far as totality, Hayfield, Verina. What about us? Hey, Rick Height, I'm not leaving you out because George Beal, who has scored 51 points in a game this year, he had, I think, for, listen to his numbers real quickly in the Bob Dandridge Classic at Norfolk State against Cape Henry. And you know, Cape Henry is a really good private school. You've seen them over the years. They've produced guys, Devin Hall to UVA. They've produced, uh, you think of 
Chris Clark, who went on to Virginia Tech. They've had a number of guys. Mark Hall's had a program that's been nationally ranked here. Against Kate Henry, who's no cupcake, no slouch, if you will. They won the game 62-46. to 46. And George Beal, who was committed to Long Island, decommitted. Now he's getting some attention from Norfolk State. Maybe even a little sniff from Old Dominion. We shall see where he's going. In that game, he was 34 points, 14 of 26, 15 rebounds, four assists, two steals, and he sat the last three minutes of the game. Wow. That's yeah, awesome. He's pretty darn good. He's pretty yeah. darn good. Well, that, that's great. You um, hear about the Hampton Roads. It's, it's always so strong. It's funny. We're talking about coaches. So now you got you got, you got Stephen Welsh. you got Darren Sandlin. you got Mario Mullen. You have um, – I'm missing some here. You could take a coach, the coaching staff in Norfolk. I don't care how old they are. They would still win their state championship. You put those guys together? I'll go a step further. They'll argue right now, even though they're in their 30s, some in their 40s. We can take these kids right now. You put us yeah. out there five on five because, you know, they're, they're that prideful. They're that prideful. I mean, just amazing talent. So, look, uh, I'm, I'm taking I'm not taking a lot of your time when you're tired, but no, you're can, 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 you, can you talk real quickly about the rest? What's going on in the rest of the state? Any uh, yeah. any sleepers? Uh, maybe uh, you know, maybe uh, the, the Roanoke Lynchburg area. What's going on sure. over there? Yeah. Oh, I've watched a couple of great games in Roanoke. Just to finish up on Tyro real fast. King's yeah, sure. Fort, Class Fordo. They they've got eight to ten guys that can play. Mm -hmm. Them and Verona. I think I mentioned to you a few months back. Them and Verona. If we get that in the state semifinals, that's going to be a war, a knockdown, drag them down, slugfest. Mm -hmm. The one thing I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the bracket for uh, if you look at A and B. I think B is going to host A, and I think D is going to host C. So that matters for all the divisions, six through one. So mm -hmm. that could be a little bit of a home court edge for Verina if they do see Kings Fork in a state semi. But the Bulldogs are very, very good. Watch out for them. Ryan Height, Coach Height's son, Caleb Brown, Sam Brennan, Deron Jackson inside. They got a lot of firepower. But Roanoke, I watched a couple games. Uh, Cave Spring. Jacob Groose, who was no stranger to the big stage, he coached at Dan River when they went to the state tournament, now trying to get his second title in a few years at Cave Spring. They shared it with Lakeland a couple years back. He's got a really good group. Stark Jones, his junior point guard, can go. I saw a couple of pictures after the game of him getting up off the floor as a guard dunking it. He's got a lot of athleticism and some bounce to him. And then Dylan Saunders, a 6'8 junior forward who can really stroke it from the outside. He had a couple of threes early on in their win of the night against Patrick Henry of Roanoke. Also, they beat Northside to avenge their only loss of the season. They're now like 18 and one, 19 and one. They won on a three point buzzer beater, I believe mm. uh, on Saturday in the Adam Ward classic against Lord Botetot. Uh, they're the favorite to me in class three to win the championship. And while Hopewell, the defending champ and Petersburg have got a big win over Hopewell, in the event up there, the uh, coaches for the Cure up there at Virginia State on Saturday in Richmond, those two will say they have a good chance to win it at a Richmond in Class 3, and they do. I think the power in Class 3 is out west in Roanoke, where you have both Cave Spring and Northside, who's really well coached under uh, Billy Pope. Billy Pope, he's, he's still out. around, huh? Still around. He's been, uh, again, all these guys that you say, they haven't retired yet. Billy Pope at Northside, you know, 500-plus wins. Ed Young at Nansen River, 500-plus wins. He got retired. They're still, they're still coaching it. They're still doing it. Um, no, he's done a fantastic job at Northside, and uh, his team could certainly get Cave Spring in another rematch. That could be a chapter three down to the wire type of game. Arion Jernette can score it for them in the backcourt. They have a lot of good parts, and they can hit three balls. Um Outside of those two in the Roanoke area, uh, James River Buchanan has been kind of the sleeper story. Radford has been known for the years. Rick Cormany's team defending, getting after you, shutting you down. And James River just picked them apart pretty bad. I mean, they, they uh, stifled them by about 20, 25 plus points of the night, which was a rematch game they had lost previously. They have enough firepower, does coach Ethan Humphreys, who, again, I'm starting to feel old, uh, Julian. I mean, these guys, Ethan Humphreys, I watched him win a state championship or play in a state championship a few years back. And now, He's coaching these kids with Jane, uh, Jason Easton and Patrick Clevenger and Corey Easton and Ryan Steger and all these guys. Heath Andrews is an NC State baseball commit for them as a pitcher um, who plays in the uh, backcourt. And uh, they've got a good group. They're really growing in confidence. To get that win over Radford was kind of a big moment for them because that was a stumbling block the last few years. Uh, and they just beat Perry McClure with the big 6'11 uh, kid inside, Spencer Hamilton, who's had a couple of triple doubles this year, as we mentioned. I still think Perry McClure is the favorite in class one. But, uh, yeah, they're looking they're looking really good right now, James River. So they could be a team to watch out for uh, on that side of the state. So, really, uh, those are the main ones. Patrick Henry of Roanoke, William Fleming out there in class five. Both of those teams are dangerous. I would not sleep on William Fleming in class five because I think I, think I mentioned to you before, if I were to label favorites for you in each of the six divisions, class six, I feel pretty good about Hayfield, would not sleep on either Patriot or Lansdowne because they could certainly get them possibly. 
Class four, I feel like it's Verona or Kings Fork. If you gave me those two or the field, I'm taking those two. Sorry to rest of you teams in class four, but I'm going with those two. Class three, if you gave me Cave Spring or North Side of the field, I'd probably take those two, although I'd caution Lord Botetot, Liberty Christian, maybe Petersburg or Hopewell. I think Petersburg is as athletic a group as there is in class three. They just got to hit free throws. That's what kills them every year in the playoffs. They hit their free throws, they can win the whole thing. Um, and then class two, class one, I would go with probably John Marshall in class two. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't count out East Rockingham or James River, one of those teams, maybe Union, the defending champ, to get there. And in class one, I'd go with Perry McClure. Would say watch out for Lancaster out of the northern neck. They've been good. But class five, that one to me, you could not give me two or three teams and say take the field. I couldn't do it. I would have to take the field. I had to take the field. I could not take two or three teams. Even as good as Maury's playing defensively, L.C. Bird with their balance, their size and balance. Uh, the teams like Potomac Falls, Stonebridge. I just feel like class – and Kickatan's playing great. I just feel like class five is the most unpredictable of them all. So if you told me someone like a William Fleming or Patrick Henry Roanoke, maybe not the best team in that bracket, Julian, but they got kind of on a run and had some things break, similar to how Stonebridge did last year. I'm not saying they're going to rally from 18 points down to beat somebody in the state final, but – I could believe it given that their path might not be as hard to get there as say it would be for a Maury or a Kickatan, somebody out of Tidewater. Right. All right. Well, that, that's great. Did, did you want to um, highlight any, we, we, we kind of went fast through the class one and two, any uh, prospects that have come to be that are big division one prospects that we may not have uh, known about when the season began? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Spencer Hamilton, the kid at Perry McClure is one. Yeah. He's, he's six eleven, Um, and so generally you're trying to find those guys if you're a college that they can walk and shoot gum. This kid can not just walk and shoot gum. He can play basketball. He can hit shots from the outside. He can score it in a paint. He's really been impressive. I mentioned Dylan Saunders earlier from cave spring six, eight kid. Who's really been uh, impressive. I like what he's done. Uh, I tell you what, there's a kid that's not, I don't think he's getting a lot of attention, but I'll, I'll shout him out at William Fleming. A junior forward by the name of Elijah Mitchell. Uh, really been impressive with how he's played. He scores it with ease. I think he's a sleeper prospect. What level, you know, what I go to, to the lengths of saying Division One, Division Two, I don't know yet, but I think he's a, a kid that if colleges happen to go check out or people go see the scouts, they might say he's better than I realized because he scores it with, uh, with a lot of ease in terms of the basketball. And then in, in the case, I mentioned some of those James River players. They've got a couple of them already committed uh, to schools for the next level uh, with Clevenger and Easton and some of them. But it's, it's an interesting year because I've had this conversation with both high school coaches and college coaches, Julian. A lot of schools are waiting because they don't know what their roster is going to look like. This is specifically more your Division ones, Division twos, because of where things are with, you know, the transfers and the portal and how much roster room they're going to have, I can see, and I even saw this with the second signing day for football here recently, I'm seeing some players of the years in their district and all state kids go to a school as a preferred walk-on. And as you know, back in the day, preferred walk-ons basically meant you're just going to ride the bench, probably not play. But what's going to happen, I believe, and I'm not seeing this with all preferred walk-ons, so I don't think I'm trying to pass on advice to kids and parents here, but what I believe is you're going to see this in football, maybe on a couple of instances, particular instances for basketball, they're going to get that preferred walk-on. Somebody's going to transfer out. And after a year, if that player gets on the floor and plays a little bit, that preferred walk-on could be scholarship, depending on how he gets acclimated to the system. And again, not saying a preferred walk-on is the way to go, but I think that could be the trend for some of these high school kids that they want to get their foot in the door at some places. Um, they just got to make sure they take the right guidance and take the proper steps and continue to develop and train and work hard because that's going to be the key, whether you're a walk on or a scholarship kid. But I think that's what's going to happen with some of these cases, because we're seeing we're seeing a lot of kids that are all state players just getting overlooked because these colleges do not have room and they're having a hard time justifying their boss, the assistant coaches, the head coaches. How do I take this kid that averages 28 points per game who's two years away? in some cases, two years away from being two years away from a kid who's played his fifth year of college basketball. And now he's transferring over. They're going to take that fifth year guy every time because he's more seasoned. He's more ready. He's older. Yeah. And even if the young person works out, they, they could then transfer. So now the, right. the, future, the future is now in college basketball. It's not uh, or college sports generally. So you made a great point. I just had that. I can't say what school I had a text from a college assistant who said to me, uh, can he play at our level? He's asking about a kid. I said, yeah, I think he can. And then the next question was, well, is he going to leave us in two years? I mean, that's, that's exactly where the mindset is 
for some of these places do I take that kid? So there's, there, it's easier for them to say more reasons why we shouldn't take that kid who's good enough to play for us, can play for us, would play for us, would play against us if we don't recruit him because we'll just go get the kid that transferred from Iona or St. Peter's or Southern Illinois, whatever school it is, because I'm doing these games with the women now with, with Old Dominion, and I'm looking on these boards I'm doing with the rosters, and I can tell you there's at least four to five to six to seven players every time out for mm. the opposition, even for us, transfer from such and such, transfer from Florida Atlantic, transfer from Indiana, transfer from fill in the blank, George Mason, whatever school it is. It's constant, and I don't think that's going to stop until the NCAA – you know, take some steps to either, I don't think it'll eliminate it, A, but either, you know, adjust it or B, make you have to sit out after a year, which they've had in the past. There's going to have to be some changes to it because right now the high school kids are getting kind of the short end of the stick with things. Yeah, I, when I went to the George Mason um, ODU game earlier this year, uh, the men's game, there were a couple of players, I forgot which roster, that, that it was the third school they'd been on. And just, that's just it's, it's, it's too much. Hey, so Matthew, I, uh, you know, I get a little bit of guff because I don't do enough girls sports and uh so i went to the uh i went to the madison oakton game the other day and i thought it's oh, a good game, game right oh well uh, you know i love coach Priester, and i got to know coach stone they, i had him on a, a panel and madison is just incredible i mean they're they're tall they're athletic they're deep uh they're they're um very very seasoned or i think mostly seniors um just can any can anybody beat Mad can anybody beat madison oh it's gonna be hard you know who's playing really well I don't think they've lost a district game. They've lost one game overall. They're in the same region. I think they are. I have to double check it here with Madison. Now, now, now you got me wondering here uh, in class six, but they, they, they've done a good job for many years. Uh, controlling tempo is Langley. Now I would think Madison's better, but uh, that's a team I might circle and say like, Hey, keep an eye on Langley. Cause they're having a really good year defensively. I think they're holding on the girls side teams under 33 points a game. So wow. if they keep that score down against Madison, who's putting up like 60 a game, they'd have a shot, but I, I'm with you. If you look at Madison's numbers, they've been scoring way more than everybody else up there. And I think they're going to be hard to handle. They would be the favorite and they might be the whole favorite uh, top to bottom in class six. I'll never count out though. Cause she does a great job over there at Thomas Edison, Diane Lewis, shout out to her. She's had her program always in the hunt. I remember when she had Carol Miller a few years ago. And unfortunately when she had Carol Miller, she ran into Highland Springs and Princess Anne. So it was just, it was like, ah, oh, if you were in another bracket, Another year, you probably would have won it, but she ran into those teams. And she's been knocking on the door. I think she's going to have a shot to do some damage in this tournament because Edison's having a really good year. They had a couple setbacks early, but they're playing some stellar defense as well there. Of course, they're in 6C, uh, I believe. So they maybe would see Madison in the state semis. That could be a good game. Yeah, well, it'll be, it'll be great. How, just real quickly, is uh, Princess Anne or Hampton, or are they, do they have uh, good teams this year? Yes, Hampton, Shonda Billy's done a fantastic job there. It's amazing the coaches Hampton High's gotten every year. I mean, Mike Smith in football, legendary, retiring, five or plus wins. They've had Walter Brower, legendary, still helping out Eric Brown, who's a championship coach in his own right on the boys' side. And then they got um, they had for years the late, great Danny Mitchell for baseball, who was the line coach for Mike Smith uh, in football. And he was a great coach and got them to having, you know, 18, 21 seasons in baseball a couple of times. And Shauna Bailey's doing a superb job. Kennedy Harris at guard for her. It seems like every radio show I, I do our stats, Coach Young and I do on Saturday mornings, it's like Hampton wins 94 to 18. Kennedy Harris with 27 points, uh, eight assists, and nine steals. It's like she's filling a stat sheet every time. And she lost, arguably, her best player in Jayla Herp to Smithfield. Mm -hmm. Now, what would be interesting is if they run into Smithfield in the 4A playoffs, that will be an interesting storyline. And watch out for King Sport. King Sport got a transfer from Princess Anne. Yeah, someone left Princess Anne, believe it or not. Soraya Griffin, who was their second leading scorer as a freshman behind Isaiah James, who's now at NC State, last year during Princess Anne's, I've done forgot, Julian. They've won like 11, 12, 13 championships. Darnell Dodger's got more rings than fingers and toes. I know that. He could open up a jewelry store for crying out loud. But um, they're going to be a factor still PA because – they just got back Zakaya Stevenson, who had left them, just returned. So their scores the last couple of games have been a little eye-opening as they've been starting to pummel teams again. I don't know that they're the favorite. I do think they're probably on a collision course with Norview girls. Coach Young and I discussed this on our radio show on Saturday mornings. If you missed that, by the way, shameless plug, if you don't mind me giving out there, go to our oh, podcast page. ESPN Radio 941.com. Check it out on the 757 Sports link. You can hear our, our all our babble and our nonsense. But uh, and hear us talk about hoops and all kinds of things and interviews and so forth. But we talked about it, and I took his his poll of it. He's like, man, those are some fantastic girls' game. If we get Hampton, 
versus King's Fork and say a region final or even a region semifinal, depending on how the power ratings go in class four, that's going to be a knockdown, drag them down game. And Hampton had a, one that had one of those a couple of years ago when they went to the States and shared the title with a Monacan when they had to play Lake Taylor in the region semis in their gym. And that place was packed for that game. One of the best girls games I've seen in years, probably since either that Princess Anne Oakton state championship game years back or that Princess Anne Lake Taylor state championship game years back. It was just a superb game. And then in five, Norview and Princess Anne have met before, but Norview, Jonathan Wilson's got a team that's really playing good defense. Uh, Jada Bryant, who is the younger sister of Norfolk State star Joe Bryant, who is up for MEAC player of the year. And uh, he used to play at Lake Taylor. Well, his sister Jada, who's now at North at uh, Norview, she's putting up major numbers. And um, they got a good win in that Bob Dandridge Classic against Monikin, who's going to be a contender in Class 4. So I, Norview PA could be a great game. And in years past, I'd say you take PA nine times out of ten. Now I'm not as sure because I think Norview might be ready to try to climb that mountain. I think it's an even game, just like I think the Hampton Kings Fork game is a toss up game. If you if you held me down to make a pick, I'd hate doing it because usually I'm bold about making picks. Those two are hard to call. I'd maybe give a slight lean to Hampton and a slight lean to PA haven't been there before. But if you told me Norview and Kings Fork won, I would not be surprised. Yeah. Well, Matthew, this, this is great as always. Uh, look, I, I would implore people to go to Virginia Preps. Uh, obviously, great stuff. Covers all the sports. Um, you know, they got polls and everything. But also, make sure you check out Matt's, Matthew's YouTube channel. Uh, awesome uh, interviews from uh, right post-game. He gets it right when they come off the court. And, you know, you got, you got the emotions still flowing. All, always good stuff. Um, also, he has his ESPN radio interviews on his YouTube site. Uh, Matthew, tell them where to find you um, for ODU and also on your on your ES, on ESPN. Sure, and just yeah, hit that subscribe button for my YouTube channel. Just type in Matthew Hatfield. Tell them yours, Julian, because the more subscribers we get with this, the more we can do this stuff, right? Exactly. I, I'm just Julian Brown, uh, uh, Devil Legends Podcast. So yeah, go ahead. There you go. But uh, yeah, ESPN Radio 941.com. We have a, when you when we do a game live and it's on 941. Hit the listen live link. If you go to odusports.com though and go to our women's basketball page, you'll see the little link for the radio. And even if we're on TV with streaming or ESPN Plus, you can also watch it that way there. But go there if you follow me on. Twitter at Hatfield Sports. I'll usually tweet out links for different things that I'm doing with our website with Virginia Preps or with obviously um, Old Dominion or the ESPN radio show and our, and our YouTube channel with different things with the interviews and so forth. So it's all pretty easy to find if you just hit that follow button on uh, Twitter with Hatfield Sports or hit up hit us up on YouTube and subscribe. You'll get notifications whenever we put something up. Well, that'd be great. Ho hopefully we'll, we can check in with you on the, on the week of the state tournament. Maybe you can give us a quick uh, quick update. That would be great. I will be down in Frisco, Texas, but I'm sure if you catch me at some time, we get a little bit of a downtime, which we ought to have. I'd love to do it because I'll be I'll be uh, craving some hoops from the Lone Star State. This is going to be the first year, Julian, I won't be in person at the Siegel Center when they have it since 2004. So it's the first one I'm going to miss in person in like 18 years. So I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to shed a couple of tears, but I'm sure I'll be watching the guys doing the broadcast on the NFHS and following from afar and and still just uh, checking out the hoops action. Because, uh, unfortunately, the, the time of our conference tournament is the same time as the state tournament, unless something between now and then changes that we don't expect to change. So, well, awesome. Well, look, uh, safe travels. I'll be at the single center. So maybe I'll maybe I'll be updating you a little bit this time. Yes, <laughs> please do that. And if I don't text back, don't take it personal, but I do check my phone. I, I will be wanting updates on what's going on from, from across the way. It's funny because uh, generally when I'm, I'm at, at those things, people are asking me what's going on and I'm busy doing the broadcast. I can't, you know, give them the text. I'd like, just follow the Twitter, follow the blog, follow the game, but I, I will definitely uh, appreciate that if you can do it for me. That'd be great. Oh, uh, sure. Well, it's the least I can do. So, so Matthew, thanks again for your time. I know it was a tough day for you, but this has been great. Uh, lots of, Awesome material as always. Hey, always a pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. Okay, Matthew. Have, have a good Sunday. You too. Enjoy, Julian. All right, buddy. Thank you.